Interesting. One, two. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Because I know everybody's real excited to be here. So. All right, we'll go ahead. Uh, we're going to be here close to 11.30 noon. That's what they told you, right? Okay. It goes by really fast. How many has been in my class before? All right. For the ones that have been in my class before, you don't have to do the fire extinguisher simulator again if you don't want to. I encourage you to because at a fire is not the time to learn how to use the fire extinguisher. But if you, if you don't, when I say the lecture is over because you're all here for, you're getting two class, huh? Testing one, two, three. Yeah, it is. How about that, any better? Who can't hear me? That better? Okay. Um, in any event, when you get done, when everybody gets done, you're gonna go outside to the desk that you came in and you're gonna sign out for attendance and Joe, my assistant, will give you a, a card that says that you were here at the class, okay? So everybody gets a card. The ones that have already done the fire extinguisher, you don't have to do it. The ones that haven't done it, I would really encourage you to do it. So it's two classes. You're gonna learn the seriousness of a fire. And then the second class is what you are going to do to help the people to get out of the building in the event of a fire. And we'll take a break uh, in between there, okay? So the first class is the fire and life safety class. This is the class on what to do in the event of a fire. My name is Tim Szymanski. I'm the public education and information officer for Las Vegas Fire and Rescue. A little bit about myself so you know I know what I'm talking about. I've been on the job for 45 years. This is my 45th year on the job. Worked eight years in Cleveland, 19 years in Atlanta. And in the city of Las Vegas actually paid me to move out here and take this position. Um, I worked every position from firefighter, fire, paramedic, firefighter, all the way up to fire chief. I was the fire chief back east last year. But my, new spe my specialty is working with the news media. That's why they hired me. And I was the spokesperson for the 96 Olympics in Atlanta, for Atlanta Fire. And they says, we want you to come to Las Vegas and do what you were doing in Atlanta, taking care of the news media. So I'm on call 24-7, 365. I come to work anytime there's something bad happening to take care of the news media. So today I've been up since two o'clock this morning and then I came here from, from a fire. So the great part about that is I get to see what's causing the fires. And in seeing fires for 45 years, I can tell you that fires have changed a lot in 45 years. They've changed a lot in the last 10 years. And even in the last couple of years, I've been seeing some things that I haven't seen before ever. So we'll talk about those uh, in class. The other thing is, is that I'm a certified instructor by the state fire marshal. I have the highest rating. So that's why you'll get a card from me that says that you've been through certified fire and life safety and fire safety warden training. Uh, if, if the big one comes in, I might have to leave, but I don't think I'll cancel this class. So I'll have to keep it burning till I get there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about what fire is, what fire does, what you should do in the event of a fire. You can learn how to use a fire extinguisher properly. And we're going to use, uh, talk about a couple of other fire and life safety procedures that you should know. It says that about uh, 4,000 people, it's actually about 3,000 people die each year in the United States due to fires. Uh, about 30,000 people are injured. About 80% of those injuries uh, occur, or fire fatalities occur at home, the place that you feel the most safe. This is my 19th year in Las Vegas. Um, I've never been to a fire where people died at work. Now, I, and I'm talking about the city of Las Vegas proper. And this is in a city. And that's because buildings like schools and hospitals and this building and shopping centers and that, they have a lot of safety systems that are built in by the fire code, the law, that were approved by the commission and by the city council. 
to help you get out of the building in the event of a fire, such as sprinkler systems, emergency lighting, exit signs showing you how to get out of the building, doors that swing in the direction that you're trying to escape. For years and years in history, the doors used to go into the building. The crowd doesn't back up when you're trying to escape. When they're in a panic mode, they're pushing against the door. Make the doors go in the direction that people are going. Put panic hardware on there so if they fall against the door, it'll open up. Or you just have to reach up with your hand and push it open. All kinds of things built into a building. Uh, stairwells. Uh, I'm asked all the time, stairwells. Those are bunkers. People all the time say, well, what if I'm in a high-rise building and it catches on fire? If you make it to the stairwell, you win. It is a bunker. If you ever watch a building being built, the very first thing that they build is the stairwells. They're a concrete bunker, and they're even more modern today with exhaust fans and all kinds of things. So you can get in there, and you're in a safe haven until you get down to the bottom of the building and escape. All kinds of safety systems in buildings like this one here, where I feel 99.9% .9 confident that if there's a fire in this building, you're going to get out of here alive, and you're probably going to get out of here without injury. But when it comes to your home, there are no codes. That's your castle. You can do whatever you want to your home. And I go into a lot of homes, a lot of homes. And just when I think I've seen it all, that guy beats the last guy. It's just unbelievable what people do. They put bars on windows, and then they weld the lag so you can't put a wrench on it to turn it off. If you make it impossible for people to get into your home, you've made it impossible to escape. We do not have a magic tool that takes bars off the windows in two seconds. I've talked to people through bars in my career, and they were dead before we could get them out of there. Uh, fences in the middle of the house to keep animals on one side and people on the other. Vehicles, right? second floor apartment, a guy's got five pristine motorcycles sitting in his living room with gasoline and oil, all kinds of things in it. What amazed me more is how did you get them up here? Did you like go in the elevator or drive up the steps? Um, how about the one, who, anybody here from animal control? The guard crocodile, right? Guy's got a crocodile running around in his house loose. Not a guard dog, a guard crocodile, you know, because I guess he had a, what is it, about this big? I guess you guys tweeted it out. It was, a, I guess it was a pot farm or something in the house. Just all kinds of things. So what I tell people in these classes, I'm going over to this class to tell you what to do in an event of a fire. You know, the, the job says you should know what to do in case there's a fire at work. What I'm telling you is the fire is going to occur at home, not at work. And if the fire occurs at home, it's going to affect work. Because if you have a fire in your home, you're going to be so screwed up, you're not going to be able to come to work. And nobody knows that better than me because two years ago, last January, my house caught fire. And I paid people to take care of my house. I see what causes the fires, and I said, I don't want that happening in my house. So I hired people. And on my day off at 7.30 in the morning, the phone rang and it says, fire alarm office. And it says, where am I going this time? And they said, you'll never believe it. It's your house. And I said, yeah, obviously you got the wrong address. And no, there's a red van parked in a driveway and there's dogs howling. Your neighbors called it in. And I remember her standing at the end of the drive. They were talking. She says, thick black smoke coming out the roof of the house. And we, my wife and I got back in time to say our house burned. I can tell you from personal experience, it's the equivalent of a death in a family. And things happened to us that I didn't ever think, what, I didn't know they existed. I thought the Red Cross comes and takes you, fixes everything up. The insurance company is going to come and fix your house up, and they're going to call you on the phone and say, your house is done. You can move back in. It's going to take about three weeks. Six to nine months is average time. We didn't, we, the fire was at 719. We didn't leave the house until 1030 that night. And then when we got in the car and we were driving to the hotel where we were going to stay, I told my wife, I says, hey, you know what? The only clothes we got is on our backs. We're going to have to stop on the way to the hotel to get something to change clothes. So at Target, we dropped $500. At Target, just, you know, 
We hadn't eaten lunch meat and a loaf of bread, a sweatsuit, toothbrush. And then they said, be back at 7.30 in the morning because the insurance company has hired private investigators. We're going to hire our own investigators. We're not going to use your investigators. If you've got any kind of a position, they're going to hire investigators. And then they go through your bank records and they do all kinds of things. We have a, we have a ten, at the time, an eight-year-old that was living with his grandson. I'm a guardian. No one ever told me that he was going to wake up every night for two months and cry in the middle of the night. How come I can't sleep in my bedroom? You're there. Where am I going to live? What am I going to do? What, what do I have to do? Just so many things going on, you're not going to be able to come to work, so somebody at work is pulling a load for you. So, Or maybe you die in the fire. Now they've got to hire somebody to replace you, and they made a big investment in you. <laughs> so, and it happens. Get a call from one of the gas stations, and it says, uh, Josephine hasn't been to work in a couple of days. Do you guys mind going over there and see if she's all right? She won't answer the phone. So we broke in, and she's sitting in the easy chair. The television set is on. She's sitting in the easy chair. She's all burned up. The chair's all burned up. In a condominium, nobody even heard the alarm. It happens. So pay attention to this, because not only does it affect work, it affects your work, your home life affects work too. So what are the leading causes of fires? The number one cause of fire in Las Vegas, in the United States and in the world, because I talked to a lot of fire chiefs during the Olympics and said, hey, I'd like to know what's going on in your country. Why do you guys have fires? It's all the way around the world. Cooking fires is number one. We go to a cooking fire every single day. Every day we have a cooking fire. Most of them, 95% are what we call a pot on the stove where the food burned up and it made a lot of smoke and it stinks, it stayed in the pan. The other ones get out of control like this one here. It's usually cooking grease. When cooking grease catches on fire, it's worse than gasoline. If it burns for more than 15 seconds, it bought the house. You're not gonna be, you're not gonna put it out. That's why you stay in the kitchen and you cook. You don't go read emails, take a shower, run and visit the neighbors, run to Walmart's and pick up a few things. When she came back, the apartment was gone. You got 15 seconds to shut off the stove, take the lid of the pan, a cookie sheet, a pizza pan, something, and just drop it on that pan and cut off the oxygen supply. That is the best way to put that fire out. Don't throw salt, sand, sugar, baking soda, wet towels. I've heard them all on there. It's just going to cause flare up. It's liable to come back on, onto you. You absolutely never, ever throw water on a grease fire. It will expand 4,200 times its volume, which means if I throw this much water onto that fire faster than I can blink my eye, 4,200 cups will be on in the kitchen. Pushes that liquid up into the air. Looks like a mushroom cloud. Goes out in every direction. Everything that touches catches on fire. The walls, the floor, and you. Nothing more painful than a burn. It is absolutely the most painful injury a human being can suffer. You can't make the pain go away unless you put the person in an induced coma. And they can't do that for the first couple of hours when they take you to the burn unit. Fortunately, we got the Lions Burn Care Center down at UMC. Not every town has a burn center. We, we have one here. We're lucky. But the best we can do is take the pain away by 50% and you're in a burn unit, cooking grease fires, you're gonna be in a burn unit for a few weeks. And all you do is hear people scream all the time because it hurts and all they're doing is putting new dressings on. Start, say to the are top of the line, absolutely one of the best burn units. Bottom line is you don't ever wanna get burned. It is the worst injury you could ever suffer and cooking fires is the number one reason why they occur in Las Vegas. Um, we're seeing a number of microwave fires um, picking up. Just like cars, they break down. Uh, the fires occur for two reasons, because of maintenance or people use them improperly. The reason I put this up here is because microwaves are the leading reason why children are burned in Las Vegas. So I go to the burn unit every so often and I talk to the nurses because a lot of times people will go to a facility to be taken care of because they don't want the authorities being notified. They're afraid their kids will be taken away. 
So I asked the nurses, well, what's the number one reason why kids come to the burn unit in Las Vegas? I thought it was playground equipment or something like that in the hot sun. And all the nurses at one time said, cup of noodles. Kids trying to cook their own food in the microwave. You know, it says on there, let it set for two minutes. And you know, when that stuff comes out really hot, it's still cooking. For two minutes, it still cooks without the microwave being on. But the kids don't know that, and they take that food, and they put it in their mouth, and they transfer the cooking process to their mouth. And it's the leading reason why children are burned. It's fully preventable. You're not allowed to touch the microwave. If you want something, you can come and ask me. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have the opportunity to teach them how to do it. But until they know how to use it properly, they shouldn't be allowed to touch it. School district doesn't have microwaves in classrooms anymore. Just in the teacher's lounge and in the cafeteria. This is the one that has really changed in the last 10 years. <laughs> These are not made up pictures. Uh, and this is probably the most scary one of them all because this is the one that got us at our house, an electrical fire. It's in second place and it will stay in second place forever and ever. Nothing will ever take the place of cooking fires being number one. Electrical fires have come up into the number two place, and they will always stay there. Electrical fires cause more damage than all the other types of fires combined. Handle fires, combustibles too close to a heat source, careless smoking, cooking fires, you add them all up, they don't add up to what electrical fires. That's what I went to this morning. Electrical wiring's burning in a wall in an apartment complex. Nothing the people did. Bad wiring. 44 people are out of their apartment tonight. It's going to be at least three weeks before they can get that wiring fixed. It's going to cost them thousands and thousands of dollars. My, my electrical fire was uh, the little exhaust fan in the bathroom. And I had those changed out. I bought them by the case because we go on so many of those. And I says, I, I don't want that happening. It was one of the new fans. That caught it, it shorted out and caught fire. Um, a week later, I went to an office building that had the exact same model fan in the men's room on the first floor, an office building on West uh, Sahara. It caused $9.5 million damage, and it took them 13 months to get back into their building for a $29 fan. You think today about all the stuff that you have at home that's electrical that you didn't have 10 years ago. 10 years ago, people didn't have a television set in every room of the house. They do now. Telephone chargers. Everybody's got one of those strips with six little um, outlets that you can plug in that goes into a two outlet plug. Here's a couple of, let me give you a couple of hinters because I tell people this stuff and they don't believe it. Um, when you have a fire in your house and you leave, either in a county or the city, I didn't know this, I found out during the fire. An inspector from the county or the city, is there an inspector in here? Anybody from the county or building and safety in here? Because if I'm wrong, you, you correct me. Because this is what happened to me. They come in and they do an inspection of your house right after the fire. And that's they look at the amount of damage, and the reason for um, they do that is they want to make sure that everything that you need to live in that house safely is done by the insurance company. So uh, the insurance company will come in and inspect it, and they look at the damage, and they uh, make up a booklet called a scope, and it tells you all the damage, room by room, by inch by inch, and how much it's gonna, how much they think it's gonna cost. And then the inspector will come in, and he will look at it, she will look at it, and they have their own little scope. So in my case, they didn't want to, rep they didn't want to replace the air conditioner in the attic where all the thick black smoke was. We're just going to clean it. And the city inspector says, absolutely not. You will never get that clean in a million years. It causes cancer. You're going to have to replace it. I told the insurance company, you're going to have to pay for it. The insurance policy says they have to pay for it. So they're looking out for you. The other side of the coin is they're looking to see if you did anything without getting permits, like adding outlets. So every, every room, every contractor that came through my house and, and did a walkthrough to tell me, because I, I had three different contractors come in, because I thought the insurance company does the work. You don't. They don't. 
They provide the money and they put it in an escrow account. You do the work. You do the tear down. You hire the contractors. You work with the inspectors. You're in the middle and you got people yelling at you day and night, mad at you. It is unbelievable what you go through. Bedrooms are only allowed to have four outlets. I put four more in. I know what I'm doing. I build homes. But I didn't pull a permit. And every guy that came in and went, walked into that bedroom and saw eight outlets in there, he says, who pulled those other four outlets in there? Because I did it myself. You pull the permits? No. They'll fine you 600 bucks a piece for putting those in. Any wiring you put in. Because they keep a record. See, it's like a car. When you buy a car, when you bought your home, your home was approved to be the way it was the day you moved in when it was brand new. Any alterations, you got to pull a permit, you got to have it inspected, and that's why they have that amnesty thing where they say if you go down and admit that you did something and you didn't get permission and have it inspected, they won't find you, but you still got to pay for the permit and you got to do it right and, and all that stuff. So uh, electrical fire, so the thing about you have two outlets in a wall, you put six more, you can only put 20 pounds of grocery in a 20 pound bag. That circuit was measured to hold so much. And then some people put two of those out strips in one outlet. Now you got 12 outlets coming out of two outlets. It doesn't work. Uh, Nintendos, Wii's, television sets, computers. You know, when you unplug your cell phone from the wall and a little black thing is still in the wall, your iPhone is still, your white one is hooked up. Um, it's still cooking on the wall. Besides making a power company rich, it's cooking and they catch fire all the time. This is the way, after we had a fire in our home, we were paranoid. We still are today, especially with electricity. And this is the way I feel about electricity because I've been there and done that. Electricity is a bunch of bad snakes in your house. And it's just crawling around all the time. And every time you plug something into the wall, you added another snake. And it's just wanting to bite you. And every time you look around, you, I look at a room different. When I go to bed, I walk around the house about three times. And I'm looking at things. And if which one is going to get me? He's going to bite me when I'm not looking. And that's what electricity is. And this morning, it took out 44 people. They're out on the street for something they didn't do. Sometimes it's nothing that you did. But think about all the electrical stuff in your office. Uh, HVAC systems, all kinds of things. Candle fires, uh, people still use candles. That's old fashioned. This, I, left, I made the mistake of leaving this in the car. Um, I don't know why anybody uses real candles today when you can use an LED candle. When you have a real candle, you've got to have 12 inch clearance all the way around and over it so if something falls on it, it doesn't catch on fire. You never leave a candle burning in a room unattended. You never go to sleep with a candle burning. You don't have candles around children. It's an open flame. When you're done with it, I would like you to set it in a sink. Now, how many times people, and it happened to myself, the candle, that you blew it out, and you woke up the next morning, and it, um, it was going, and you go, how did that happen? Uh, Osborne, the one that's on uh, the TV in the afternoon, Ozzy Osborne's wife, what's her name? Sharon. Their house had a big fire. She's making PSA. She swore. She said, I put that candle out when we went to bed. And it burned up their house. And she volunteered in LA to do PSAs on the dangers of candles. Bed Bath & Beyond has got a whole section of these now. They got remote control. They're colored. They're really made with real wax. So you can see I made the mistake of leaving this in the van. It melted. You can't tell it's fake. And there's no possibility of having a, a, a fire with it. Careless smoking remains to be the number one reason why people die in fires. Smoking has really changed over 45 years. It used to be in the old days, people would smoke in the house. And we would teach people, you know, when they had a party, everybody would be smoking in the living room and that, to stick your hands down between the cushions and feel for cigarette butts so they wouldn't smolder during the night and catch the sofa on fire and just don't smoke in bed and all that. People don't smoke inside the house today. Where do they smoke at home? The garage. It's number one. 
the garage, the most dangerous room in your house. It's a gas station. Think about it. It's got a vehicle out there with gasoline and oil, paints, thinners, pesticides, insecticides, anything bad you got out there in a garage. What do they have at gas stations? No smoking signs. Every garage should have no smoking signs all over it. And then you look in the garage, probably didn't notice, all the outlets are way off the floor. And the water heater is off the floor. Why? Because gas fumes won't go above 30 inches. So people's cars would leak gasoline or they took the lawnmower or accidentally kicked the can of gas over. It would spill, it, the fumes would go over to the water heater pilot light and they would explode. Now they're up above where the level is and you shouldn't have a problem. The problem with the garage is if you ever see garage doors open, and I like to look in people's garages because this shows society, it's a man cave now or a woman cave, especially with seniors. If you look out there, they got couches and chairs and tables and all kinds of things. Uh, I've seen some even with candles in them. And she didn't have a garage half an hour later. But, but that's how it changed. You know the other reason why people smoke in a garage? Because a lot of people are smoking things that are against the law. And if they went out in the backyard, the neighbors would smell it and they'd call a cop. So, you know, you go in there and you ask them, what caused the fire? I don't know. I think lightning struck the garage or something. And <laughs> there's this glass thing laying all over the floor, you know. The other thing is at work the way employees smoke at work. It's changed at work. Where does most people smoke on a job? Right outside the door, right? Right right outside the door, the employee's entrance. You know, they usually got an ashtray right there at the door so you can take that last drag before you get into the, into the building. What does the code say? 30 feet from the door. Although I heard a rumor they're removing that. Is that true? It's a health code. It's not a fire code. But here's what's happening. Two things, and I've, I've seen this, and it's just recently too. People will throw cigarettes out on the ground, and they roll off. And, you know, if you're trying to start a fire, like in the movies, the guy has a little spark, and he's blowing on the embers to get that campfire going. It's always windy here. And the wind blows it, and it goes up against the building, and it catches the bottom of the building on fire because most buildings are wood frame. Just happened at Zappos. Was filling up the building full of smoke and we went outside and found it where a cigarette had been thrown on the ground and the wind blew it up. Or they got the ashtrays up against the building and it's filling up with, uh, the heat goes through the ashtray into the wall. It's like a chimney and it starts the attic on fire. Best of the West uh, Applebee's, 5.30 in the afternoon. They notice a little bit of smoke coming out around the eaves. We got up there and that thing was just ripping. Nobody knew it down below because the ceilings are so well insulated because of the air conditioning and that. I've seen it at homes, those columns around going to your front porch and that, those are all hollow. One guy threw his cigarette down on the ground and it caught that column up, went all the way up the attic and it's considerable damage. The only good place for a cigarette is in water. Use an ashtray that has water in it or flush it down the toilet. But it's just because people don't take care of it. It's the leading cause of fatal fires in Las Vegas. 60% of the people that have died in the last 20 years was smoking related. Uh, the other thing is we have a big problem in this town with uh, seniors on medical oxygen and smoking. And I'm asked all the time by seniors, if I stop using my oxygen, how long do I have to wait before I can light up a cigarette? That's why they're on oxygen. Uh, and the, the truthful answer is you're not supposed to smoke. The oxygen doesn't burn. The oxygen makes other things burn faster. So when they got their mask or cannula on, it leaks out and saturates their skin, their hair, saturates the clothes about right here. When they light up that cigarette, it's like taking that match and throwing it on the old type charcoal barbecue. It just goes, boom, and it's done. And what happens when you get startled? You go like this, you go, <gasps> and they suck in those flames and they get inhalation burns. Any type of a burn to a senior citizen is life compromising, even a second degree burn. Seniors should never get burned and that's, uh, uh, 
You know what? I actually had a lady that drilled a hole in her mask so she could put the cigarette in there while she was. I told you, it's a great job. Children play with matches, a match or a lighter in the hands of a child is as deadly as a gun. Um, I would rather they had a gun. Kid picks up a gun, he usually kills one of their kids. Matches and lighters are multiple deaths. Two, most of the time, three deaths. And they usually are hiding, not to get away from the fire. They don't want to be punished. And for about the last year and a half now, every case that I know of where kids died in a fire here in Southern Nevada, um, where kids died in a fire because of matches and lighters or there was a presumption that they did, the adults are in jail. The authorities are starting to play hardball. I've been pushing for this for a long time. You wouldn't leave a gun laying out there where the kids do. I get all the time, I want you to come over and yell at my kids and tell them they're not allowed to touch the matches. No, I'm not going to do that. I, you, you wouldn't leave a gun laying out. A match, you want to smoke, you do it responsibly. You put those matches up where the kids can't touch them. You lock them up. They're that deadly. You don't know where your matches and lighters are. Ask the kids. They'll tell you where they're at. They know. Uh, combustible is too close to a heat source. That's anything that produces heat. Remarkable, all the things that make heat today, battery chargers, TV sets, refrigerators, all kinds of things. I had one guy that stopped at um, Walmart or something and bought one of those portable refrigerators and stuck it on his workbench out in his garage so he could keep his beer out there. Um, especially in the summer times, those compressors, they really get really, really hot and it'll catch it. The thing was made of wood and while he was in a swimming pool, black smoke started coming out over the house. Battery chargers, unbelievable how many fires those things start. We had one hotel over here uh, that was completely rented by the military. They were doing maneuvers or something. Guy put a battery charger on top of a bunch of cardboard boxes he had in his room that charges portable radio batteries, like 50 portable radio batteries at one time. Stuck it on top of the box. I mean, you know, people don't think about these things. They make a lot of heat. While they were at dinner, the alarms went off. Caught fire. Luckily, there was a sprinkler head over there and only caused about $25 damage. Anything that, uh, water heaters. Um, when I came here in 96, when we were the fastest growing area in the United States, we were going on a garage fire once a week. That's because everybody was unloading the moving trucks, throwing everything in the garage so they could get the truck back so they didn't have to pay another day's rent and they'd ram everything up against the water heater. Uh, three feet, 30, 36 inches, three feet, one meter away from the heat source. And if you're in an apartment, you had that water heater closet. That's not a storage closet. It's not a locker. That was made special for that water heater to have the clearance in. It's not supposed to be another thing inside there with it. And yet I go in there and people got stuff packed all the way up to the ceiling. Not supposed to have anything in there. It's a water heater. So in this building, what, what I think what's going to catch on fire, number one is going to be electrical. It's going to be HVAC, a computer, a UPS. Uh, something of that nature because uh, this building, I bet you, it's just a snake farm. It's like my building, a school. Uh, one of the high schools, 3 o'clock in the morning. Laptop just like this Dell caught fire in the classroom, the battery. $50,000 damage because of the smoke. There's just a ton of, of, of electrical stuff in, in our building, so that would be the number one. I'm not too concerned about smoking material uh, here. Uh, arson. Uh, I tell people every building in the city's got a bullseye on it saying, hit me. How big is your bullseye? That's what, you know, so some buildings like MV Energy, they got a giant bullseye on it. BLM when they're rounding up the horses. The Family Courts building, probably got one of the biggest ones at all. People that are really upset, and those are places that you would assume, you know, we had one lady that. I assume it was a lady, because it was in the ladies' room, that crawled under each, underneath the stalls and then locked the stalls, and as they were crawling out, they lit the toilet paper on fire. So when the people would run in there, the doors would be, well, it just made a lot of smoke, but it evacuated the building. And So I, I, I would say yours is not really big, but here's what I tell you, this is a government building some days, everybody loves you right now. Some days, everybody dislikes you. And those are the days that you need to be cautious. You 
you can't be complacent. We, we have a lot of bad people. I'm going to tell you people, there are things that are happening in this world that you don't know about. I don't discuss them. I'm not supposed to. I'm, but I am going to tell you, there are some really bad people out there. And they sit up all night thinking up of ways to hurt other people. And they're pretty ingenious. You, the bottom line, you never let your complacency, you don't get complacent. Never let your guard down. When that fire alarm goes off, you should leave. This building is so big, I don't know something bad is happening on the other side. But I don't want to be caught in it like the World Trade Center. They told those people to stay in the building. The system said don't leave. They were taught not to leave the building. When there's a fire in a building, that's a bad thing. You should leave. You can walk back in, but if it calls down on top of you, it's all over. So if you know there's a, if the alarm goes off, you shouldn't say, do you think that's a false alarm? If you're in a strange building and alarm goes, you leave. Many times you hear some of the bad things that are going on where people are shooting other people up in the building. They pull the fire alarm to let other people know. Leave. When a guy sticks it in your nose and pulls the trigger, it's too late. Leave. So arson is a possibility. Um, kitchen fire, break room. Um, you guys, I've never been on a fire in your cafeteria here, so you do a great job. Equipment room, very, that happens from time to time. Vehicles, if a vehicle catches on fire, all I want you to do is leave it burn. Don't go out there and try to put it out with a fire extinguisher. The minute that thing caught fire, the insurance company wrote it off. They do not repair burnt vehicles. They're taking it to the dump. And it produces the most deadly gases known to man. It's a loser. When you see our eyes go to it, they are encapsulated with breathing apparatus on it because it's so deadly. Using a fire extinguisher on a car that is burning is like using a BB gun on a B-1 bomber. You're not going to put a dent in it. Just get people away from it and stay away because it's a loser. The smoke is deadly. It's cancerous. And you don't have any signs, but I put that up there because some people have signs and when it rains, after about the second or third day, when that water starts seeping into walls, usually the second day, we start getting a lot of electrical calls. So what is fire? It's called combustion. I'm going to go through this really fast. It's going to have heat, fuel, and oxygen. It's the fire triangle we all learned about in school. But actually, it's a four-sided figure called a fire tetrahedron. And the secret to putting a fire out is removing one of the four sides. That's what we do for a living. When we go to a fire, we look at it and say, which one of the four sides are we going to take away? Well, we generally take the heat away. If we lower an object below its burning temperature, it's going to go out. Wood is five to 700 degrees. I use water out of the fire hydrant, which is generally 60 degrees, and splash that cool water on that hot object. It's going to go below 500. Fire is going to go out. That's why we use water. You do it every day, and you don't even think about it when you use your stove at home. You've either shut off the natural gas or the electricity, and the burning process stops, which is the fuel. The fire extinguishers that you use in buildings today uses a dry powder chemical that was invented in 1900, still be used in today, it works out well, that disrupts the chemical chain reaction. When that stuff gets on the objects that are burning, has to get on the items that is burning, it will disrupt that chemical chain reaction and the fire will go out. If you have light, heat, gas, and smoke during a fire, we're not going to worry about the light. It's the other three that you need to know about. I'm not going to get into the stages right now. Um, I'll explain them in just a minute. In a building that is not, in a building, especially your home, and I want you to remember this about your home because that's where it's probably going to happen. The temperature at the ceiling will be in excess of 1,000 degrees. At this level where you're standing up, it'll be between 400 and 800 degrees. On the floor, between 90 and 130 degrees. Your skin will start to melt at 160 degrees. If you breathe in a breath of air 150 degrees, you can sense the inside of your lungs and you won't be able to take another breath. The coolest place is against the floor. A lot of deadly, deadly gases are produced during a fire, carbon dioxide, sulfide, cyanide, water vapor. But the most prominent and dangerous gas, the one we need to be most concerned about is carbon monoxide, a tasteless, odorless, invisible gas, which is produced by anything that has a flame, candles, furnaces, anything with fossil fuels in which the hemoglobin in our blood will absorb 
200 times faster than the air that we breathe. Our bodies actually love poison gas more than the air that you need to breathe. It's an aesthetic accumulative gas, which means when you breathe in carbon monoxide, every single molecule is immediately absorbed and put it into the bloodstream. When you breathe in oxygen, you only use 4%. The rest of it is put back out into the atmosphere. But carbon monoxide isn't. Everything goes in, and it puts cells to sleep as it's moving around. Your arms and legs will quit moving, and you won't be able to move them, and you're trying to get away from the fire. But you're not going to know it because it is the worst absolute drunk that you could ever imagine. You don't know where you're at. Many times you find victims going towards the fire when they thought that they were just trying to get away. They actually really don't know what's going on because their mind is so screwed up. So that's what's so dangerous about carbon monoxide. And then it eventually will put your lungs to sleep and you'll stop breathing and you die of smoke inhalation. But the thing that's the most dangerous, and this is, this, I, I just cannot stress how bad this is, is the smoke. And it's because of all the misrepresentation that we saw on television and movies. You know, people are jumping over furniture and they're trying to escape and talking on their cell phones while they're trying to get away. And that's what people think at television. That's because they want you to see what's going on. When you see a column of black smoke up in the air when you're driving around, that's not a building burning down. Buildings do not burn down anymore. They burn up on the inside. And that's because of all the contents that are inside the building. Everything is man-made. Very rarely do you find anything that's natural. This, this is a stretch right here. But in your home, practically 99% of what you got in there. And the biggest culprit is polyurethane foam, which is the stuffing in these chairs. It's the carpeting. It's your sofa. It's your pillows. It's your mattress. It's made from petroleum products. It's literally gasoline. And when that stuff catches on fire, it burns as bad as gasoline. So just after the fire in my house, I did a thing for Fox 5 News at 10, and I wanted to show them that on the 10 o'clock news that polyurethane can fool smoke alarms not to go off. It's called the aquarium test. So we ripped up my sofa in the living room because I, I knew that was, it was gone because of the fire. And we put it inside a 30-gallon aquarium and made two cushions to simulate a sofa. Stuffed a soldering iron in between the two. Then we put a piece of sealing on it and sealed it off. And we had smoke alarms, test instruments, and all kinds of stuff on it. And then the TV camera went right up against the aquarium. And it was monitoring. You could see the timer going, how long did it take the smoke alarm to go off and all that. I had to do that three times. Every time I did it, we had to spill all the stuff out, the, the used uh, spent polyurethane, get fresh stuff and put it in there, clean everything up, clean the glass because it was real dirty. So I used paper towels. Glass had to be crystal clear so when the TV camera went up there, you could see everything that was going on. I used paper towels. When I was done cleaning the glass, the paper towels looked like someone had taken a quart of motor oil and spilled it out on the floor, and you wiped it up with the paper towel. It was literally dripping of motor oil. That's what you sleep on. That's what you sit on. You're literally on gasoline. And when it burns, it burns fast and furious. So the fire will produce this smoke and its temperature. That black smoke will be as hot as the flames itself. You don't have to worry about the fire touching you. The smoke is a thousand degrees. It is a sponge with all those poison gases in it that I talked about. It starts at the ceiling because the heat and smoke go up. That's why you have chimneys. So it's going to cover over this ceiling. And as it's spreading the room, it's like you have a big, like if I had a big water pipe in the middle of the floor and this room was waterproof and the water started going out, it would hit the walls and eventually the room would start filling up. Well, with heat and smoke, it's the opposite. It starts from the ceiling and comes down. So as it's coming down, these lights would be obscured and in the windows and the door. And inside of 90 seconds, it will be pitch black. You will not be able to see your hand in front of your face. But the thing that's the most dangerous is it, there is absolutely no air in smoke. None. Not a molecule. You drown in smoke. <coughs> you got to get it into your head. Being in smoke is the same as being underneath water. 
And if you want to live, you get down on the floor on your belly and stick your nose against the floor, which I teach the kids, you're swimming underneath the smoke. Fire's got to have 16 to 21% oxygen to stay alive. That's the same amount as a human being. And its nose is on the floor. If it went all the way down to the floor, it would suffocate itself and die. Keeps an area about this high off the floor with clean, cool air to breathe. If you're in a boat on a lake and you fall out of the boat, you know you got to keep your head above the water to breathe. Same thing in a smoke-filled building. you got to be on the floor with your nose against the floor if you want to get out. And you stay there. You raise your head just this high off the floor, and the temperature up here, you take one breath, you're going to singe the inside of your lungs, and you won't be able to take another breath. Now, when we get there, we have all that gear on, and we got that tank on our back, and people call it an oxygen bottle. Now, we wear scuba gear. The exact same thing scuba divers wear, only it's configured different because of where we work. But if I stuck him in a pool of water and held him underneath the water, he wouldn't drown. Because he, because water and smoke are exactly the same, the equipment has to be exactly the same. If you don't learn anything today, this is the most important. You have to swim underneath the smoke if you want to live. You see smoke, you drop to the floor, even if it's light smoke, because it could be smoke coming from a car, which produces the most deadly gases known to man. Smoke rises doesn't go down. Okay, so uh, this is another experiment. I had about 200 people invited. I built two bedrooms, uh, put just, just made them in the bedrooms. One was with a sprinkler system like you got in a building here. Um, the other one, I just wanted to show how quickly a room is consumed. So uh, I got a, a, a fake window up there. There's a uh, waste basket. I didn't put gasoline in. I didn't do anything to make it burn faster. I don't have to. It comes like that. Went to Bed Bath & Beyond and bought the stuff. The fire's starting right along the bed there in a waste basket from a cigarette dropped in a waste, uh, uh, waste basket. And everything that you see going up in the air would actually be going down the hallway into other rooms in the house. This is at about uh, 20 seconds after the waste basket starts. This is at uh, 30 seconds. This is 45 seconds. This is at 60 seconds. The black smoke is down the bed already. This is one minute and 17 seconds. This is one minute and 30 seconds. At one minute and 51 seconds, the room flash, everything is an inferno. It's being reduced to an ash. Temperature is in excess of 1,000 degrees. Nobody would um, survive that. You hear a tree burning and it's marching down through the rest of the house. Firefighters come and put the fire out. Look at that. The room's still there. The picture is still on the wall. What's gone? All the polyurethane, the mattress, the pillows, the carpeting, the drapes. They'll just go in there and reskin that room and you'll move back in because buildings are made with fire resistant materials. So we're walking down. Uh, we see an office uh, down here and there's smoke coming out of it. Um, this is, we get there, um, the fire, the smoke alarms go off, the alarms go off, the enunciator goes off, and we push the office door open and we look and there's a guy in the office, he's got a sofa there, he's laying on the floor, the sofa is smoking, do I go get the fire extinguisher, do I call the fire department, do I, what do I do first? If you remember the word race, and this was made up for uh, nurses, and we've been using this for about 70 years, this will tell you the, the order of business that you should be doing. Ours for rescue, we're going to grab that guy and pull him away from the fire. Anybody that's in the line of fire, we're going to pull them to safety and get them to a safe place. That does not mean you run into burning buildings. This means if you're right there and you can move a person away from the fire, you move them. R is for rescue. A is for alarm. We can't come and make it go away unless somebody calls us. And you have to dial 911. We don't have a big board. Used to in the old days, they had building names and little lights, and when it lit up, that meant the building was on fire, and we went. We have one of the most sophisticated 911 systems in the world. It is, it's just absolutely amazing the way that it works. All of our equipment have computers in them, computer voices in the station. When you call, the computer figures out where you're at, pretty close on cell phones, direct if you're calling on a landline. Um, 
we have these little war game computers and it's always going through these scenarios saying, what if this happened, what if that? They know where all of our emergency vehicles are. There's a map showing where all the vehicles are going. And we don't have to look at the map and say, well, that engine's closer and that engine's closer. The computer does all that. And the instant you call from this building, it's saying, what's, what's going on, what's going on? And she answers the phone, fire medical, what is the emergency? Clark, uh, uh, Clark County Government Center, 500 Grand Central Parkway. Got a fire on the third floor in an office, an electrical fire, got heavy smoke. She's gonna type fire in a building. Uh, we got some priority calls. This one's gonna get a real high priority call on it, which means how much equipment we're gonna send. And the computer says, oh, I know that. Four engines, a truck, a rescue, two chiefs, the air unit, a whole bunch. And it zaps that information to them and says, get going. And she's still asking you questions on the phone. And then uh, a lot of times people start yelling, why are you asking me all these questions? Get them in route. She doesn't push buttons. She doesn't talk on a microphone. We got computer voices in a station that tells us where to go. It goes directly to the vehicle, so if we're out on the road, and whoever is closest to the, where the caller is, regardless of which fire department they're on, the computer thinks there's only one fire department in the valley. It doesn't know that there's a north town, county, city. It sends the closest unit because it's always looking. We're reading everything that she, when she's typing, you'll hear her typing in the background. We got screens in there, we're reading. It's like you're talking to us in the truck. So make sure that you call 911 from a safe place. If you're at home, I want you to concentrate on escaping, getting your family out, going to a safe place outside, then calling 911. At the 30 second mark, you're not gonna be able to see your hand in front of your face. At the one and a half minute mark, it's gonna be too hot to be inside the house. At the three minute mark, it will be so hot inside the house your shoes will melt to the floor. If you're in an unprotected building, and that means a system, a building without a sprinkler system, and you're not out of there, within the first 90 seconds after that smoke alarm goes off, you're gonna die. I, I go to all the fires in the middle of the night. I see this stuff. And these people said the smoke alarm went off. I couldn't find the front door when I went down the stairs. That's how bad it was. Um, and that's because of the smoke alarm. Unbelievable. I had one guy, a young couple, they just moved into a house. They didn't check the smoke alarms. They didn't know they weren't working. So they're laying in bed sleeping. He thought someone had broke into the house and was choking him to death. So he's got this mag light. Everybody should sleep with a flashlight next to him. So in the event of an emergency at night, you can find your way out because there's no electricity. So he says, I grabbed a mag light and I was gonna hit him in the head to get him off me. And when I picked up the mag light, it went on and I could see the room was completely black smoke. I couldn't see a thing. So he kicks his wife out of the bed, onto the floor. Where do you need to be? Best place he could have, best thing he could have done. And they crawl down the stairs and he says the flames were coming in out of the ground. Those two kids came within an inch of losing their life. I couldn't tell him how many times. I said, you don't know how close you came to dying. I mean, literally less than 10 seconds, you would have been dead. That's how fast it is. So that's why the smoke alarm is so important. Um, stay cool and calm, answer all the questions. C is for confined, close the door. The best piece of fire equipment in a building is the door, and a lot of lives and property would be saved every day if people would simply close the door. That black smoke, before you see it go outside, it's going to go up the building. It, uh, it's going to go through the building. It is a cancer. It destroys and it kills. And it spreads really, really fast. It goes through cracks in the walls. It just, it's just unbelievable how evil it is. It can't go through a closed door. When an alarm goes off, all I want to hear is doors closing all over. It's your best defense. Which is the most dangerous room in the house? The garage. Doesn't that door slam going into the house? That's the wall. That's a fire door. And if I told you to keep that door closed because it's the most dangerous room in the house, people wouldn't do it. So the law says, make sure that door, put something on that door, it slams. Because that's the most dangerous room in the house. Now you know why that door slams. Doors are the best piece of fire equipment in a building. Don't ever block fire doors. Don't ever prop doors. 
to exit ways, stairwells, doors. If you're going to leave your office, close it. When you leave the building for tonight, all doors are closed. Because if a fire starts like in the school, when that laptop catches on fire, it's confined to that one room. They left a door open in the classroom, and they got everything in the hallway. It is a great piece of equipment. And E is for extinguish, escape, and evacuate in that order. If the fire is not more than two minutes old, you were in the immediate area when the fire started. You got a fire extinguisher that's charged and ready to go. You have been trained how to use it, and you have taken care of RAC. You can attempt to put the fire out with using the fire extinguisher. And I'm going to get into that after we take a 10-minute break. We are way ahead of schedule, so we may not be here till noon. I'm disappointed. So, uh, so let's uh, let's come back at 20 till, okay? So you can go to the restroom and get something to drink and that sort of thing.